Hello everybody, today I will be uh, discussing a little bit more about the history and origins of the horse and how it relates to here in America because uh, I mean we've talked over it before in uh, previous videos that the horse is originally from America. We're going to get that information today again, we're going to show you the sources in case you're new to this information. Uh, you know, we've been living a a myth basically when it comes to the history of the horse in the americas and when they went in the indigenous people so i wanted to make that clear that the american indians did have horses before europeans came and we're going to show that today i've shown uh this before already uh for example this is one of my videos right here this is part nine of untold ancient american truth the origin of animals, mammals, camels, horses, and dogs, and a whole lot of other uh, things. Uh, it's a great video, very informative, one of my favorite videos. I always go back to it, a lot of good info. And as it says here from Life Science, the surprising history of the American wild horses. What is that surprising history? All right, so we're gonna get this like it's the first time. We also got a great uh, new article I found uh, that deals with this. It's basically in, in the relationship between 
the indigenous people of America and the horse. And we're going to deconstruct the Eurocentric myth, all right? All right, so again, I'll be showing excerpts from uh, this video right here, Part 9, Untold Ancient American Truth, Origin of the Animals, all right? We're going to get into this uh, video again a little bit, and we're going to be reading that article. So we're going to break this down. I hope you guys enjoy this. Thanks for tuning in. Much love and respect to everybody in the chat because we did this uh, live with a premiere. We had a, a live community. So thank you for being here right now. All right, so we're in this website, lifescience.com, right? It says here, 10 extinct giants that once roamed North America. A lot of you probably already seen these images and uh, know about these animals. All right, so I just wanted to real quickly just show you something right here. So like right here, it says the North American horses, right? Because this is what they always tell us, right? That European settlers introduced horses when they landed in the New World. But little did they know the thunder sound of ancient horses hooves once covered the continent. Ancient horses lived in North America from about 50 million to 11,000 years ago when they went extinct at the end of the last ice age, said Ross McPhee, a curator of mammalogy at the American Museum of uh, Natural History in New York City. Uh, so now what he's not telling you, right, is the origin, that where they originated, right? He just said they lived here, right? So I mean, it leaves you thinking, like, oh, they must have come from Asia, though, right? But, okay, as it says here, one of the great peculiarities of this extinction is that they died out in North America, yet managed to survive in Eurasia and Africa, which is why we still have horses and their relatives. Hmm, donkeys and asses. So, the ones in North America died out. You're going to see this is a trend, as we're going to read throughout all this uh, information. Something definitely happened over here in America. And, you know, we've been hearing about the mud uh, floods and all that, and, uh, you know, the flood and how it's looking like America is and was the true old world so flood um, mud flood whatever you want to call it happened most likely more on this side of the world there was a mass extinction here something uh, happened we got the story of the Bible we're gonna go into it a little bit right and uh, how it pertains to stories from here in America uh, about Noah right and how he brought animals over there and uh, so where did he supposedly land right in Asia over there and that side of the world so Hmm, kind of correlates with what they're saying here. It's weird, right? That they died out in North America, just managed to survive in Eurasia and Africa. Hmm. This article I found here in National Geographic correlates with what I'm going to basically be showing. And it says here, the rights of mammals. All right. And we're going to go to a certain part of this article. So it says, early in the Miocene, Africa's long isolation ended when it and Arabia came back into contact with Eurasia. That's when the ancestors of many mammals we think of native to Africa arrived, all right? So a lot of animals that you thought were native to Africa, that's when they actually came. They weren't in Africa, all right? First came the ancestors of the antelope, all right? We're going to see, well, if you study the hoofed uh, animals that originated in America. So antelope has hooves. And then we got cats. We're going to see where they originate. Giraffes and rhinos. Later, around 10 million years ago, North American mammals like camels, there you go, camels, horses, and dogs. All right, North American mammals, these are from America, originate in America. Camels, horses, and dogs. Yes, dogs. You know my Shalot video, Anubis and Shalot, and how the ancestors had this animal very sacred and the same kind of mythology as you find with Anubis is the exact same with Shaloth, very ancient dog they had and you see the dogs originated in America, all right? So it says about 10 million years ago, they began to arrive there, all right? Almost every animal that roams the Serengeti today is a relative newcomer to the continent, all right? You're always boosting about the lion and giraffes and camels and all that stuff and that's not even native to your content and we're going to read from this article right here it's called the relationship between the indigenous peoples of the americas and the horse deconstructing a eurocentric myth all right we're going to deconstruct this eurocentric myth by yvette running horse colin a dissertation submitted in partial fulfillment of the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Indigenous Studies 
University of Alaska Fairbanks, May 2017. All right, so it says here in the abstract, this research project seeks to deconstruct the history of the horse in the Americas and its relationship with the indigenous peoples of the same lands. Although Western academia admits that the horse originated in the Americas, it claims that the horse became extinct in these continents during the last glacial maximum between roughly 13,000 and 11,000 years ago. All right, so that's what they tell us, that the horse went extinct even though it originated here. We had all different types of horses. All right, we're going to show you that real quick. So this inversion of history credits Spanish conquistadors and other early European explorers with reintroducing the horse to the Americas and to her indigenous peoples. However, many native nations state that they always had the horse and that they had well-established horse cultures long before the arrival of the Spanish, all right? You hear that? It's all a lie. History has been written by Western academia to reflect the Eurocentric and colonial paradigm. The traditional knowledge of the indigenous peoples of the Americas and any information that is contrary to accepted Western academic view has been generally disregarded purposefully excluded or reconfigured to fit the accepted academic paradigm. Although mainstream academia and Western science have not given this native credence to date, this research project shows that there is no reason, scientific or otherwise, that this traditional native claim should not be considered true. All right? They cannot prove it wrong, is what she's saying. The results of this thesis conclude that the indigenous horse of the Americas survived the Ice Age and the original peoples of these continents had relationship with them from Pleistocene times to the time of first contact. And this investigation, critical indigenous research, methodologies, and grounded theory are utilized in tandem to deconstruct the history of the horse in the Americas and reconstruct it to include cross-cultural translation of many indigenous peoples, Western scientific evidence and historical records, the knowledge, right, of many indigenous people. This dissertation suggests that the latest technology combined with guidance and information from our indigenous peoples has the power to reconstruct the history of the horse in the Americas in a way that is unbiased and accurate. This will open new avenues of possibilities for academia as a whole, as well as strengthen both native and non-native communities. All right, so now uh, we're back in lifescience.com uh, and we're going to get into the horses now, right? So, I mean, now when I look for it, um, they're kind of admitting now, right? They're changing the script, call it a Mandela effect if you want, but... But I remember when I was young and, and, and it was like almost a common fact that horses did not originate in America, that they were brought by the Spanish. That's what they that's what they told me in school, that they were never here, that the American Indians or anybody here, you know, they didn't have, you know, never encountered a horse. It wasn't part of our uh, history at all. So let's debunk this story now. All right, because it says here, the surprising history of America's wild horses by Jay Kirkpatrick and Patricia M. Teixeira. Modern horses, zebras, and asses belong to the genus Icus, all right? Icus, the only surviving genus in a once diverse family, the Ichidae, all right? Remember these two words. Based on fossil records, again, based on science, what we can see, what we can prove as fact, the genus appears to have originated in North America about four million years ago and spread to Eurasia, presumably by crossing the Bering Land Bridge two to three million years ago. Again, you yes got the horses. We been had them. All right. And they get, again, they're saying presumably. They don't know. They don't know, but they know. They know. They'll say appears because they have to suck up all these years of lies, all this uh, false history that they've been telling us since we were young. Right. So now the genus appears. We appear to be have been mistaken. It it originated here in North America. That's what they're saying. All right. Horses. We had horses. They didn't bring it over here. 
you got to prove that to me that there wasn't no horses here already that looked just like the modern horse. You got to prove it to me because now you're just going with theories and you're just going with imagination because if your logic tells you, well, there was horses here and originated here, they say they went extinct. Now we got to believe everything they say, right? Oh, they went extinct. Oh, oh, they didn't exist. Lions. Oh, no camels. No, no. All right. So we got to believe every, now we got to believe, right? But just let's just lose use for this video. Let's just use our logic. All right. Now, again, it went from North America, just like the camel to Asia, right? Because when we grew up, they were telling us all these most all animals were originating in Asia, Europe and Africa. All right. And now we're seeing that very important animals were originating here. I'm talking about the camel and the horse. All right, so where, again, is the true Garden of Eden? You're talking about Mesopotamia over there. You're talking about where's the true cradle of civilization if we got corn, right? If we started agriculture, right? There's a lot to correlate here. I hope you're following along. Again, following that original immigration, there were additional westward migrations to Asia and return migrations back to North America. Return. So I thought the Europeans brought them. No, they actually came back on their own, they say here, as well as several extensions of eco species in North America. Now, that's the other thing. Several extensions of the same eco species, like, like horses you never even knew about, existed only here, only in America. The last prehistoric North American horses died out between 13,000 and 11,000 years ago at the end of the Pleistocene. But by, the, by then, Ecos had spread to Asia, Europe, and Africa. So some got saved, right? Animals that on paleontological grounds could be recognized as subspecies of the modern horse originated in North America between 1 million and 2 million years ago. All right, so we're in this website, Encyclopedia Britannica now, all right? And the title is a little bit covered. They're hating on me with this ad right here. It says, Tracing the History of horse evolution and domestication all right this is encyclopedia britannica we're going to zoom in it says new clues to the origins of the horse and and the spread of its domestication were presented in 2012 all right so this is new information like i told you before they told us lies all our lives that there was never horses here they didn't want you to think like that they didn't want you to think oh romans horses you know greeks horses egyptians horses they didn't want you to relate all that stuff together here in America, right? But again, new clues up to the origins of the horse and the spread of his domestication were presented in 2012 by a multinational team of scientists led by Vera Warmuth of the University of Cambridge in their bid to piece together the genetic structure of the wild horse, Ecus ferus, and to determine the location of the first domesticated horse populations. The research sampled the DNA of more than 300 animals across Europe and Asia. All right, so this is real science. From Vilnius, Lith to Overkangai, Mongol, Mongolia. The data collected by the study allowed scientists to estimate the timing of the evolution of Eferus and confirm the location of its first domestication. All right, so it says the evolution of the horse. The evolutionary lineage of the horse from its origins during the Eocene epoch 55 million to 33.9 million years ago through the present is among the best documented in all paleontology. It's the best documented, meaning they got the best evidence, scientific data, all right? To boldly state what they're saying right now, all right? They're letting you know, all right? There's no doubt. During the early Eocene, there appeared the first ancestral horse a hoofed browsing mammal designated correctly as Hiracoterium, but more commonly called Eohippus, the dawn horse. Fossils of Eohippus, which have been found in both North America and Europe, show an animal that stood 4.2 to 5 hands high, diminutive by comparison with the modern horse, and had an arched back and raised hindquarters. The legs ended in padded feet with four functional hooves on each of the four feet and three on each of the hind feet, quite unlike the unpaddled sing single hoofed foot of modern equines. 
Now I know up here I just said something about uh, North America and Europe, but check out what it says down here. It says, although Aeolipus fossils occurred in both the Old and New World, the subsequent evolution of the horse took place chiefly, chiefly in where? Again, North America, the true Old World, the true Garden of Eden, the true cradle of civilization, North America slash America slash so-called Atlantis. During the remainder of the Eocene, the prime evolutionary changes were in dentition, hippidion, meaning little horse, an extinct genus of horse that lived in South America from the Pliocene to the Middle Scene. Hmm. Wow, look at this. So this is Hippidion. What is the difference between this and the modern horse? Tell me. All right. Originated in South America. All right. Wikipedia evolution of the horse. The evolution of the horse, a mammal of the family Equidae, occurred over a geologic time scale of 50 million years, transforming the small dog-sized forest-dwelling Aeolipus into the modern horse. Paleozoologists have been able to piece together a more complete outline of evolutionary lineage of the modern horse than of any other animal. Much of this evolution took place in North America, where horses originated, but it became extinct about 10,000 years ago called the relationship between the indigenous peoples of the Americas and the horse, deconstructing a Eurocentric myth. And we continue here, 1.1, a Eurocentric myth. In his article titled, Essays About Americas, National Myths in the Past, Present and Future, Ira Chernus addresses the fact that the word myth means so many things to so many people. However, in our everyday English language, myth means a fiction or a lie. Some myths are total fictions. Though they can have powerful influence on a society, they can also be debunked by fact, which places some limit in theory on their influence. For this particular re research study, the Eurocentric myth regarding the existence, extinction, and migration patterns of the American horse will be further explored. Every child who goes through the American school system is taught that the Spanish and subsequent European explorers are responsible for reintroducing the horse to the Americas and therefore to the native peoples. J.F. Kirkpatrick and Patricia M. Fascio offer the following account of this claim in their article titled Wild Horses as Native North American Wildlife. Right, so they're saying he's given a quote of these what these people were saying about the horse, right? The precise date of origin for the genus Equus, so this is the scientific name, the ancestor, first horse, is unknown, but evidence documents the dispersal of Equus from North America to Eurasia approximately two, three million years ago, all right? So from America to Eurasia, all right? Not from Asia or Africa to America, all right? They originated here. 2.3 million years ago, they're saying, and a possible origin of about 3 to 4 to 3.9 million years ago. Following this original emigration, several extinctions occurred in North America, with additional migrations to Asia, presumably across the Bering Land Strait, so presumably, they didn't know, and returned migrations back to North America, so they returned back. Over time, the last North American extinction probably occurred between 13,000 and 11,000 years ago, so probably. I remember this is Jay Kirkpatrick and Patricia Fascio. They don't know, probably, right? In 1493, on Columbus' second voyage to the Americas, Spanish horses represented El Caballos were brought, brought back to the Americas, first in the Virgin Islands, and in 1519, they were reintroduced on the continent in modern-day Mexico, from where they radiated throughout the Americas' Great Plains after escape from their owners for or by pilfering. All right, so this is the official mainstream narrative that horses went extinct, even though they originated here. They they admit that horses originated here and went to Asia and eventually to Africa and all these places. So that's the mainstream news. we got to dodge the hijack big time, as it's going to say right here. It says, this version of history can be found in textbooks, documentaries, magazines, television programs, and on countless websites, as the horse was inextricably linked with the idea of what constituted a civilized person and or a community for European cultures at the time of first contact with the indigenous peoples of America 
This plane fits neatly and comfortably into Western academia's predominantly Eurocentric paradigm. According to a research article I published titled The Relationship Between the Indigenous People of the Americas and the Horse, How the Dominant Culture's View of Oral History Denied Truth, I explain the following. When the European explorers arrived in the Americas, they brought with them their belief that all that was civilized originated from their homeland and their culture. At the time of the 1500s, 1600s, and 1700s, one of the marks of civilization included one, one's possession of the horse and one's mastery of horsemanship skills. All right, so that she's letting you something big here that to have a horse was to be civilized and to master your horse. You know, that, that was a big piece of it. So admitting that the Indians had horses, they would have to be admitting that these people were civilized like them. Indeed, ownership of Spanish horses was tied to the concept of nobility in Spain and Europe. Owning horses in Europe was a concept of nobility. All right. The AndalusianWorld.com website proclaims throughout its history, the Andalusian horse has been known for its prowess as a war horse and prized by nobility. The breed was used as a tool of diplomacy by the Spanish government and kings across Europe rode and owned Spanish horses. In addition to this, the horse is credited with being the key element that allowed Queen Isabella of Spain to end a war with the Moors that had gone on for many, many centuries, all right? This is explained further in William A. Berg's book titled Mysterious Horses of Western North America. And it says here from that book, a plentiful supply of fine Arabian horses had enabled the Moors to force the Spanish armies away from the Mediterranean shore. For almost 700 years, they had crowded the Spaniards ever northward until they had come to the land of Castile. There at long last, King John had withstood them. But King John had died and then his daughter Isabella had become queen and had sworn at her father's deathbed to drive the infidels across the sea, all right, the infidels. The task had seemed hopeless at first, but then she engaged Manuel Cortes, a childhood friend, to supply her with horses for her armies. Cortes did so well that the queen prevailed over the Moors, and now one more strong campaign should prove their end, but more horses would be needed. Horses would decide the issue. As Bert goes on to describe, the queen would give Cortes carte blanche to collect and secure all horses from anyone in Spanish lands for exclusive army use. All right, so it explains what she says. Now it says here, indeed, Benjamin Breen's article titled The Elks Are Our Horses, Animals and Domestication in the New France Borderlands states the idea that the horse was a symbol for what constituted a civilized person and or culture in the context of the Great Lakes and upper Mississippi region between 1670 and 1730, all right? That's, if you had a horse, you were prominent, you were civilized, all right? In this time, Mississippi, in the Great Lakes and upper Mississippi. For those of the colonizing culture is supported. The Tony noted that four of his men deserted upon noticing horses in the lands to the south of the Illinois because as soon as they had possession of a horse, they no longer believed themselves to be among the savages. The increased mobility allowed by horses and the presence of nearby Europeans, they implied, undoubtedly played a role in this desertion. But the Tony's phrasing would suggest that the symbolic associations between the horse and civility played a role as well. Although this belief system regarding the history of the horse in the Americas supports the worldview held by dominant Western culture, it is contrary to oral history and the knowledge of many of the peoples who are indigenous to the Americas. Claire Henderson offers a concise summary of this indigenous perspective in her article titled The Aboriginal North American Horse. This year, Dakota, Lakota elders, as well as many other Indian nations, contend that according to their oral history, the North American horse survived the Ice Age and that they had developed a horse culture 
long before the arrival of Europeans. All right, this is the Dakota, the Dakota talent. This is their story. They been had the horse. All right, and furthermore, that these same distinct ponies continue to thrive on the prairies until the later part of the 19th century when the u.s government ordered them rounded up and destroyed to prevent indians from leaving the newly created reservations you hear that they covered it up they murdered they killed all these horses just like they killed the buffalo they took most of them probably but you see they covered it up by saying they were extinct and that the europeans brought horses because what were they really doing they were really rounding them up to destroy them so they can prevent the indigenous people from leaving the newly created reservations although mainstream academia and western science have not given this native knowledge credence to date the website titled the survival of horses in pre-columbian america by terry McNamee states that there is no reason scientific or otherwise that this traditional native claim should not be considered plausible and possible all right and they quote the idea that horses could have survived into more recent times in areas south of Alaska and the Yukon was suggested 40 years ago by archaeologist Paulus Martin. He said that there was no reason why horses could not have survived in isolated areas of North America as late as 2000 BC, but more recent discoveries are revealing that horses may have been present in North America much longer, even right up until the time when Europeans reintroduced horses to the Americas, reintroduced with quote. So this is people actually doing real archaeological work. Indeed, this dilemma has been noted by many in Western academia, including John Canfield Ewers in his book, The Horse and Blackfoot Indian Culture. He states as follows. Anthropologists and historians have been intrigued by the problem of the diffusion of the European horse among the Plains Indians. It is well known that many tribes began to acquire horses before their first recorded contacts with the white man. That's the hijack paucity of documentation has given rise to much speculation as to the sources of the horses diffused to these tribes. The date when the first Plains Indians acquired horses, the rate of diffusion from tribe to tribe, and the conditions under which the spread took place. So basically what this guy is pointing out is that they don't, they can't prove how the so-called Plains Indians got their horses, right? This Lakota and Sioux and all these tribes. How did they get their horses? When did they get them? How did they get them? You know, there's no proof of that. This confusion between what could be seen firsthand, deep horse cultures and superior horsemanship skills, and the conclusion that was often recorded by early conquistadors and colonialists can be clearly seen in Francis Haynes' article titled Horses for Western Indians, as published in the magazine titled The American West. He states the following regarding the supposed erroneous perception that groups of Anglo-Americans had while watching the proud buffalo hunters in plain regalia riding spirited horses in the early 19th century. All right, so they're letting you know that the Indians were very good at riding. They had superior horsemanship skills. They didn't just pick that up from so-called white man. Thus, it says here, there was no question but that the Plains Indians had been horsemen from time immemorial. They've been horsemen. The entire culture seemed to depend on the horse, and the horse culture complex was at a high state of development, about on a level with that of the Asiatic steppes, where horses had been used for thousands of years. All right, you understand what he's telling you, this person, he, what he noticed. All this seemed to imply that horses had been in use on the Western Plains for a long period. So it says here, despite displays of horsemanship skills that rivaled those of the Cossacks, the Mongols, the Arabs, the Bedouins, and the Moors, and statements from people like George Catlin who documented that, I am ready without hesitation to pronounce the Comanche the most extraordinary horsemen that I have ever seen, and I doubt very much whether any people in the world can surpass them. Can anybody surpass the Comanche in their horseman skills? That's George Catlin. Remember who he was, famous painter, was living amongst the Indians for a while. Western academics and historians still circled back to support the claim that native horses and horse cultures 
were somehow derivative of Europe. Although historians and archaeologists do not always agree upon dates, it is now generally accepted that the first American Indian populated North America between 30 to 40,000 years ago, right? It's not hijacked with these people's barren straight crossings. Such a lengthy occupation would ensure that indigenous peoples of the Americas had an extensive understanding of knowledge and geography, flora and fauna of their territory. Their mastery of such knowledge would naturally have surpassed that of a newly arriving colonizer. Despite this fact, Western academia still supports the initial reports of a few Spanish conquistadors who claimed that there were no horses in the Americas upon their arrival to specific geographical areas in the late 1400s. Their exploration of the Americas at that time of these reports extended solely to certain Caribbean islands and a small portion of modern-day Mexico. In holding on to such claims, Western academia has chosen to override contrary accounts shared by indigenous peoples ignore numerous sightings of vast herds of horses by early colonizers, discount the sightings of native peoples with horses that were recorded by subsequent explorers long before European horses were said to have escaped from Spanish, disregard recorded accounts from settlers who arrived in the Americas in the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries and not allow modern scientific evidence indicating the presence of equus this is the scientific name for the ancestor of the horse remains during the proposed extinction period 500 years ago to 12,000 years ago to effectuate a paradigm shift. Western science claims objectivity. Ernest Bailey and Samantha Brooks state that science does not allow assumptions, but rather rests on experimental proof. Despite this purported foundation, Western science has not proven the veracity of its claim that the indigenous horse of the Americas did not survive the last ice age, even though scientists have the technology within the field of equine genetics to do so. So he's saying, you know, science is based on something, you know, that needs to be proven and all that. They haven't even proven the fact that they're saying that the horse didn't survive the ice age. So they still got to prove that. So they can't say anything about not proving anything. It, indeed, prominent equine geneticists routinely pepper their academic papers with such quotes as the following, which serves as the opening of a scientific paper titled Genetic Analysis of the Venezuelan Criollo Horse. Or Criollo. After the extinction of the, the North and South American equus species about 10,000 years ago, from causes still not completely understood, horses only returned to the American continent in the New World with the second voyage of Christopher Columbus in 1493. This claiming without proof, which in this case has been labeled as science and history, continues to de denigrate and distort the history of many of the indigenous peoples of the Americas. All right, so they're saying, you know, things like this, these quotes like this. How did this guy prove this? What did he show to prove his theory, his opinion, this claim? He had no proof. And what? It was labeled science. It was labeled science right away. All right. Likewise, it continues to provide a distorted foundation upon which other misconceptions and assumptions are made within other academic disciplines. All right. It's all a lie. It's all conjecture. It's all assumptions. It's all misconceptions. Or is it a misconception or are they doing it on purpose? As their relationship with the horse was and in many cases still is, a critically important life element historically. Culturally and spiritually for many native nations and peoples of native descent throughout the Americas, this dominant Western cultural claim was, has served as a fundamental attempt to diminish such cultures by asserting a Eurocentric position of dominance. In making this claim, the dominant Western culture is saying, without us, you will not have these sacred and critical elements of your culture. And therefore, your culture is derivative of our own. Although Western science has focused surprisingly little effort on proving the validity of its claim, archaeologists have unintentionally located evidence of echoes remains during the purported extinction period while testing samples at archaeological sites across North America. So even when they're trying to debunk, you know, that the Indians had horses, they would find bones of the horse in the time where they're not supposed to be here already. They were supposed to be already extinct long ago, and they're finding bones of the horses buried. 
in the period between 500 years to 12,000 years ago. Because they said it happened way before that, way, way before that. They already extinct after that. An example of this can be found in FoundMap, a database documenting late quaternary distributions of mammal species in the United States. All right, research is out there for you to do. They found horses' bones when they weren't supposed to be here. Scientific evidence of Echo's remains and fossils were found at various archaeological sites throughout North America. Outside of the time periods accepted by Western science for the horse and up until recent pre-Columbian historical times. These sites were located in the following states, Arizona, Colorado, Georgia, Kentucky, Montana, North Dakota, New Mexico, New York, Ohio, South Dakota, Washington, and Wyoming. Interestingly, researchers later categorized many of these findings of echoes as out, which they defined to mean unit of finding questionable, right? It's questionable. In addition, Western scientists and archaeologists have also located echoes bones and other remains that have been scientifically confirmed within the supposed extinction period, right? They found all this stuff. Horse artifacts have also been discovered in pre-Columbian ruins. Horse artifacts in pre-Columbian ruins, for example, in her book titled In Plain Sight, Old World Records in Ancient America, Gloria Farley describes and cites numerous instances of artifact evidence of pre-Columbian horses in America. They were drawing them, they were in the artifacts, they were in the pottery. So how would they know the horse if it was extinct 12, 13,000 years ago, right? How would they be painting it in pre-Columbian times? Each of which were discovered in the southeastern regions of the United States. Findings such as these serve to give credence to the indigenous viewpoint. From the late 1400s until the mid-1800s, the dominant Western culture's academic establishment claimed that the horse originated in Europe, as there is no record of Columbus having seen horses when he landed in the Caribbean in 1492, it is possible that it was their belief at that time, and therefore their truth, that horses did not exist anywhere in the New World prior to their discovery of it. However, if we are to believe that all the wild horses across the Americas today are descendants of those horses brought over by the Spanish, and other early explorers, it is important to look at the reality of the conditions of that time. For example, the Spanish ships were small in size and traveling conditions were detrimental to the health of the horses being transported. Therefore, a great number of the horses that were actually loaded onto these ships did not survive the voyage to the Americas. There's quotes for that right here. Michael Quinion, Horse Creature, Worldwide Worlds, investigating the English language across the globe, all right? And read it there. The image on the next page, figure one, was taken from Pablo Perez Mayaina, or Malaina's book titled Spain's Men of the Sea, Daily Life on the Indies Fleets in the 16th Century. It is common knowledge that horses can develop colic easily, severe stomach problems that can lead to death. If they are not provided the correct environmental and feeding conditions, Perez Malaina states the following regarding the abysmal living conditions that both people and animals were subject to on these roughly two or three month voyages. Some readers will recall that peasants customarily shared their horses with their farm animals, but the sailors and passengers were also obliged to share their scarce living space with all sorts of animals. Some of them carried voluntarily, but most of them involuntarily. In effect, the ship's crew faced serious comp competitors in the struggle to find a free space. So like, look, on top of all this, we're supposed to believe they were bringing Africans, right? In effect, the ship's crew faced serious competitors in the struggle to find a free space. Some competitors were inanimate objects since boxes and chests with clothing and personal effects were customarily placed on the decks, plus the passengers' food, food which could not be kept in the storerooms below deck, 
In addition were the nautical apparatuses stowed on the bridge, plus the capstan, the cook stove, and even the mast of all these occupied space. So all this is taking up space. So how would they bring Africans, right? Then there were the animals carried on board. Plus the animals, right? A caravel of 65 tonales that departed in 1507 toward Hispaniola carried, besides its crew and 83 passengers, 18 mares and 12 yearling calves. On this voyage, the animals traveled as cargo. Passengers customarily carry live animals to slaughter during the voyage in order to have fresh meat. We have testimonies that these animals shared places on the deck with owners who did not want to lose sight of them lest they fall into the hands of someone determined to have a feast at their expense. An English sailor commented that despite the danger unleashed by a tremendous storm, no one could resist smiling at the sight of seasick pigs staggering around the decks, vomiting. Despite facts such as these, it was not until Joseph Lady and Robert W. Gibbs work meeting for business, September 28, 1847, on the Fossil Horse of America, Description of a new species of squalites from the tertiary beds of South Carolina was published in 1847 that Western academia began to accept the idea that horse had existed on North America continent before the arrival of the Spanish conquistadors. However, upon this acceptance, they became adamant that the extinction of echoes in the Americas must have occurred many thousands of years prior to the first European contact. Therefore, despite physical archaeological evidence proving the ancient presence of the horse in the Americas, the fact that the horse knowledge and husbandry practices of the indigenous peoples of the Americas did not mirror those of the European cultures, and the fact that many native people were seen with horses when explorers first encountered them, Europeans were still credited with introducing the horse and horse culture to the indigenous peoples. Despite a number of subsequent technological advances and a vast expansion regarding the number of relevant archaeological, paleontological, and zoological discoveries, Western academia's version of the history of the horse in the Americas has evolved very little since Lady, the founder of paleontology in the United States, made his findings public more than 150 years ago. So there he's in some good points all this technology we have all this proof all the bones they found and they still want to accept those uh, unproven theories unproven theories of western academia so now i'm in this book animals of the past an account of some of the creatures of the ancient world by frederick a lucas director of the american museum of natural history all right this is from 1922 all right again american museum of natural history handbook series number four and we're on page 133 of this book chapter 10 it says the ancestry of the horse it says the horse was just as abundant in north america in pleistocene time as in europe but there is no evidence to show that it was contemporary with early man in north america so he says there's no evidence all right but there is cave paintings right and we got mexican codices right and even were this the case, it is generally believed that long before the discovery of America, the horse had disappeared. So even if there was horses, he's saying, right, it believed that they had already gone into extinction, but they told us they didn't even exist here ever, right? So now in his time, he knew this stuff. Now listen to what he says, and yet so plentiful and so fresh are his remains and so much like those of the Mustang that the late Professor Copey was was wont to say that it almost seemed as if the horse might have lingered in Texas until the coming of the white man. What? Because they were so abundant. You hear what he just said? Professor Cope says there was horses here still lingering when the white man came. Did you, you hear this? There were still horses here. They didn't bring them. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Right? This is from the museum. American Museum of Natural History. Remember the book and read and they're letting you know little 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 hints here, little secrets. All right, there was whole horses here lingering here and there still. And Sir William Flower wrote, there is a possibility of the animal having still existed in a wild state in some parts of the continent remote from that which was first visited by the Spaniards, where they were certainly unknown. The horse was here. 
my people, we had horses, all right? We were riding these horses. This is how we got around a lot of the times. They were abundant here. We had all types of horses. We were abundant. The Mustang is from here. They didn't bring these horses, all right? There was parts that they were, they were so remote that these horses were still running around. And so by the time history was written, their horses mixed with our horse, they must have just spread all over the place. All right, but letting you know here in, in this book, right, that they were still here. It has been suggested that those horses which were found by Cabot in La Plata in 1530 cannot have been introduced. You hear that? The ones he found were not introduced because it's 1530, barely getting into these places, these Spaniards. He found some horses they're saying cannot have been introduced. They were already here called the relationship between the indigenous peoples of the Americas and the horse, deconstructing a Eurocentric myth. And we continue here on section 2.3, a review of available literature of the subject matter. Now go down here. There is an account recorded by Don Juan de Oñate and cited by John S. Hawkinsmith in his book titled Spanish Mustangs in the Great American West, Return of the Horse. In this account, King Philip II of Spain gave De Oñate, the son of a Spanish conquistador, orders in 1596 to lead an expedition as far north as New Mexico. By 1598, when Oñate and those accompanying him reached New Mexico, he reported that vast herds of wild horses already occupied New Mexico. You hear that? This guy is saying there was already mad horses in New Mexico when he got there. De Oñate noted the country is so immense and so full of wild mares. Such a big country full of wild mares. Hawkins Smith continues on to say Oñate also reported that he lost 300 horses and mules in 30-day period, partly due to the inability to contain animals while wild horses were roaming nearby. All right. So he even lost 300 horses because there were so many wild horses his horses started escaping mixing in with the wild horses and so yeah in 30 days he lost 300 and this is a written primary source account all right in addition the textbook titled discovering our past a history of the united states early years by joyce appleby at credits the oñate with having introduced cattle and horses to the pueblo people however this claim is not supported by the oñate's own account of having seen herds of wild mares upon his arrival to new mexico you see so they give him credit for introducing the horse and he himself said that he ran into wild horses in new mexico so that's why you got to verify the sources when people are quoting people. You got to go to the actual source because Oñate never settled that or never said he brought horses. He said he ran into wild horses. The Spanish conquistadors were not the only European explorers to have noticed and recorded early sightings of horses in the Americas. In 1579, the Queen of England sent Sir Francis Drake to the New World. Sir Francis Drake, Sephardic Jew, all right? Drake also recorded having seen herds of horses in the Americas during his voyage off the coast of what are now known as California and Oregon. An account given of Drake's landing in the geographic areas now known as Northern California and Southern Oregon includes the English explorer's description of the homes of the native as well as the animals that he encountered. It related his wonder at seeing so many wild horses. All right. This is quotes, quoting Francis Drake, because he had heard that the Spaniard had found no native horses in America, save those of the Arab breed, which they had introduced. All right. And that's 116 footnote. You can find that quote from Drake on original narratives of early American history, early English and French voyages uh, from 1906 by Henry S. Burrage. Withal goes on to explain that in 1580, when the Spaniards returned to the area to battle the locals, they came across the horses, vast quantities of them, all right? Vast quantities of horses. Again, horses in pre-Columbus time, people, these are written accounts. These are things they never will never show us. These are primary sources. All right, we continue this part of the article where it's talking about the Chickasaw, how they were uh, being encountered to have a lot of horses, and they were rumored to have a lot of horses. They were like... They were trying to make up a lot of stories how they got these horses, you know, shipwrecks, Spanish left behind, all kinds of different stories. We're just going to get some examples here. 
that says, uh, likewise, the following account is provided by Holmes Willen, Willis Lamb entitled the Chickasaw Horse, grandfather to the Quarter Horse. On the Chickasaws, first encountered with the horse, some accounts claim that the tribe captured some of DeSoto's horses. Later, English traders introduced the horse to the tribe and trading packs trained and the horse is physically described as being small, about 13 hands and having had a very short neck. And some even had to spread their front legs to graze as some wild horses and zebras do. Now, according to Judith Dudson book titled Stories Illustrated Guide to 96 Horse Breeds of North America, there is written records of horses being sighted in Virginia and linked to the Chickasaw by the early to mid 1600s. By the early to mid 1600s, there were horses of Spanish descent in the backwoods of Virginia, some wild and some owned by Indians, including the Chickasaw, who were known as having small horses of excellent quality. A traveler from England described the horses as being not very tall, but hardy, strong and fleet. Today, some of the descendants of these ponies still populate Asetage Island, which, in lo which is located off the coast of Maryland and Virginia. Although these ponies were reported to have already been there upon the arrival of the colonial settlers. All right. So they're saying that even the colonial settlers said they were already there, even though they already said they were there. They're trying to make up these stories even though the colonial settlers already said they were already there. The assumptions was made that they must have been Spanish horses and their obvious phenotypical differences were explained away as having been a result of degeneration due to environmental conditions. So they try to explain it away, right? According to the website asategeisland.com, some people believe the horses arrived on Asatage shores when a Spanish galleon ship with a cargo of horses sank offshore. All right, so now, just like these uh, so-called uh, African slaves that escaped off a shipwreck or, or were shipwrecked, and that's how you get these so-called black people in these parts of America, right? They're doing it with the horse. So now there's a cargo of ship, uh, of horses, right? A, a ship full of horses. Now they shipwrecked, and now they got off, and that's their explanation. However, La Galga, the Spanish galleon at, it, at issue is purported to have wrecked in 1750, more than 100 years after these ponies were first reported having, having been seen in large numbers, all right? So that story gets debunked because that ship wrecked in 1750 and they were already spotted 100 years before that. All right, so I hope you guys are seeing all this correlation. Indeed, as chapter seven of Philip Alexander Bruce's book titled Economic History of Virginia and the 17th Century States by 1685, there were so many wild horses reported in the Virginia area that colonists began to hunt them. So many wild horses in Virginia. So numerous had the wild horses grown to be at the close of the century that one of the principal sports of the young men of the colony was to hunt them, not infrequently with the assistance of dogs. Saddle horses were trained especially for the purpose of threading the heavy timber of the forest at a high rate of speed. In consequence of the extraordinary fleetness of these wild animals, it was often impossible to catch them. Owing to the large number of foals born in the woods and remaining unmarked, the hunting of wild animals was not unprofitable, as to the captives belonged those upon which no brand had been placed. Uh, we continue in the article and down here is talking about some excavations that were done in the Yucatan Peninsula, which were publicized in the 1950s. The following description of this is offered on the Fair Mormon website, Fair Mormon website. And it's talking about how they're flying in, uh, in these different pits and layers. It says uh, the pits they excavated revealed a sequence 16 layers, which they numbered from the surface downward bones of extinct animals, including mammoth, appearing the lowest layers. Pottery and other cultural material were found in levels seven and above and but in some of these artifact bearing strata there were horse bones all right horse bones even in level two a radiocarbon date for the beginning of seven turned out to be around 1800 bc all right so that's way before uh 12 000 years ago right that's only about 2000 years ago the pottery fragments above that would place some portions in the range of at least 900 400 bc and possibly later might be a lot even more recent the report on this work concludes with the observation that something went on here that is still difficult to explain. Some archaeologists have suggested that the horse bones were stirred up upward from the lower higher levels by the action of tunneling rodents. All right, so they're trying to explain why they found bones that are dating to about 400 BC or later, right? Remember, they told us that the horse was extinct by 12,000 years ago in America. It went extinct. It shouldn't be here in 400 BC. They're finding bones like that everywhere, remember. Another example showing how such presumptions have affected the field of archaeology can be seen in Gloria Farley's book titled In Plain Sight, 
old world records in ancient America. And this work Farley describes numerous examples of artifact evidence of pre-Columbian horses in America, each of which were discovered in the southeastern region of the United States. She details her interaction with Dr. Joseph B. Mahan of Columbus, Georgia, at a symposium where she was showing slides of what she states are pre-Columbian horse petroglyphs found in Arkansas and Oklahoma, all right? Pre-Columbian horse petroglyphs in Arkansas and Oklahoma, all right? Dr. Mahan is a former member of the National History Sites Commission who spent 30 years researching the origin of the Yuchi Indians, formerly of Georgia and Alabama, now removed to Sapulpa, Oklahoma. Farley states, Mahan said, we kept finding small sculpted horses in nearby Alabama and a site we thought was older than the 16th century, but attached no great importance to them because of the 1540 concept. Example, the belief that no horses could have been there before 1540, all right? So because they were believing that, they was like trying to throw it off, but they were finding all these sculpted horses, petroglyphs, pottery showing that people were there interacting with horses. All right, pre-Columbus, before any European arrived, all right? Farley also knows that Dr. Mahan showed her a clay statuette of a pre-Columbian three-inch horse effigy that was found on Roots Creek about two miles from the Chattahoochee River, which was housed at the time in the Columbus Museum of Arts and Sciences in Georgia, all right? They have this, they found this, they've been hiding this horse effigy. And that Manford Metcalf of Columbus, Georgia, put into my hands a small stone effigy which resembled a horse head, which was found in 1974 dig near the Yuchi Creek near Fort Benning, Georgia. All right. This is real archaeology. They can't prove their theories. We can prove horses were here. All right. So this is uh, what they've talking about. All right. A clay horse figure, Columbus Museum of Arts and Science, photographed by Frank T. Shell. All right, this is before the 1500s, pre-Columbian. All right, horse. All right, now we're going to read from this book called Extinct Monsters and Creatures of Other Days, a popular account of some of the larger forms of ancient animal life by Reverend H.N. Hutchinson, B.A., with illustrations by J. Smith, Addison Woodward, it says here, and uh, this is from 1911. In the book it says it will thus be seen how abundant is the material for tracing the evolution of the horse in america in that country the equus fraternus of lady is believed to be almost if not entirely identical with the equus caballus identical to the modern horse what we know of the old world all right of the old world it's similar it is the same america is the true old world of course it's identical only in the upper pliocene deposits does the true horse appear and then the genealogy is complete. It roamed over the whole of North and South America and soon after seems to have become extinct. There is no doubt that man and the horse was contemporaneous in early days. All right. There is no doubt that man and the horse were contemporaneous in early days. But it can be proved beyond doubt that at the time of the Spanish conquest, few, if any, horses were left. It has been. All right. So you hear that? So a few were left they're admitting in this book right again that a few horses were left they can't say they weren't here it has been thought from certain references contained in old narratives that at least in south america the animal may possibly have still lingered on after the coming of the europeans do you hear that another source another book telling you that when the white man guy the europeans the spaniards there was already horses here possibly lingering of course they were of course they were here already this is where they evolved all right so right here we continue uh this part of the article is going into the rock art uh and petroglyphs that they found and how it's so controversial because they as soon as they see an image of maybe a person on a horse uh just like you see here uh this is from peru right this is uh called uh, a horseman petroglyph at alto de pitis peru so let's just read what it says and what they did as soon as they saw this so it says the non-scientific nature of van hoek's deduction was noted and captured in the may 2016 blog titled the horseman of alto de pitis part three by nefico.com after noting that the images and the method of the depiction of the horseman matches precisely 
the other pre-Columbian rock art found in the surrounding boulders. So this looks just like the other pre-Columbian art around there that they accepted was pre-Columbian. The author states the following. The first reaction of the discoverer was that it had to be post-Columbian rock art. Why? So why are they saying, why does it have to be, meaning it had to be after Europeans got here, post-Columbian, after Europeans got here. Why? Because everyone knows there was no horses in the Americas before the Spanish arrived. In fact, when these rock art areas were first found, the caves or areas in which they were located were all dated to a post-Columbian period based solely on the man riding a horse. So just because they saw somebody riding a horse and to them, they couldn't have horses. No, not the Indians, right? That would be make them civilized, right? No, we brought the horses, right? So they was like, oh, this has to be after Europeans arrived that they threw this. So only because they saw that. This mentality has caused the depiction of the horsemen of Alto de Pites to be labeled post-Columbian, even though it has been found in strictly pre-Columbian rock art, find where all the other rock art seen is definitely pre-Columbian. This is pre-Columbian as well, all right? This is pre-Columbian, a man riding a horse in Peru, all right? Horses were here. Indeed, petroglyphs of horses figure four within the Americas have been openly treated differently without scientific methodology or following proper scientific protocol by scientists with regard to dating for more than a century. Passages such as the following can be found regularly throughout books on petroglyphs and rock art determining the actual age of most Columbian plateau rock art sites is difficult to do with certainty, except in instances showing horses or other objects of known historic age. You see, so if they see a horse, they're like, oh, oh, we know that was after Columbus. So most of the time they can't even really tell. They, it's hard for them to really tell the age. But when they see a horse, oh, that that helps us know that it was after. No, that was that's just their conjecture. In his work titled Indian Rock Art of the Columbian Plateau, Kaiser describes the rock art of the Eastern Columbian Plateau in Western Montana. In his geographic location, he describes action scenes such as a horse and a rider and states that fewer than 25% of the animal figures in Western Montana have sufficient anatomical detail for identifications of species. But bison, deer, mountain sheep horses and dogs a bird and a turtle are known so they know when they see a horse that's a horse and this is again petroglyphs pre-columbian the following figures are located in the central columbia plateau also yet to be dated by scientific methods horses are painted at 11 sites and pegged at one other four painted examples have the characteristics elongated body long neck flowing tail but no rider one wears a saddle. The remaining horses, all ridden, range from nondescript quadrupeds, unrecognizable without the mounted human, to, to a very stylized depiction showing an obvious horse whose rider wears a flowing feathered bonnet. All right, an Indian with a bonnet, an American Indian person on a horse, petroglyph. All right, at the Central Columbia Plateau. This is pre Columbian. In addition to those horse petroglyphs that have been identified and dated by assumption rather than by utilizing scientific methods, there are some that have been scientifically dated in his article titled The Horse and Burro as Positively Contributing Returned Natives in North America. Craig C. Downer cites an example of a horse petroglyph and geoglyph that were dated utilizing scientific methods and were verified to have been pre-Columbian and post Ice Age period of the horse petroglyph discovered west of the White Mountains in Eastern California. He states the following, all right, this is real archeology, span real research. Judging from the brownish oxidation of the chiseling, this horse was not a recent addition to the ancient petroglyphs here. Scientific analysis of the patina of some of these petroglyphs has revealed ages up to 3,000 years. By visually comparing patina hues, I estimate this horse could be well over a thousand years old. All right, all right, debunk. Europeans did not bring the horse, it's been here. All right, it's been here. Donor also addresses geoglyphs depicting 53 foot long horses in the Mojave Desert near Bliff in Southeast California. Geoglyph is a word used by archeologists in public to refer to ancient ground drawings. 
low relief mounds and other geometric earth and stonework found in isolated places throughout the world regarding two horses among the several geoglyphs collectively known as the Blith Giants. He states, they were formed by removing stones of desert pavement to reveal lighter substrata, a process called intaglio, often associated with trails and dance circles formed by the pounding of human feet. They indicate that horses were held in high regard by Amerindians and in relatively recent times, the figures have been expertly dated by geologists from the University of California, Berkeley at 900 AD. 900 AD, all right, you see the petroglyph right here, let's zoom into it. All right, that's a horse. I mean, geoglyph, sorry, that's a geoglyph and that's a horse. All right, it has been dated by scientists to 900 AD pre-Columbian Europeans did not bring the horse over here. So then they were first discovered by pilots from the U.S. Army Air Corps flying between Hoover Dam and Los Angeles in 1932. They are presently under the care of the Bureau of Land Management. This figure meant that someone in California knew enough about the horse to represent it on the desert floor, centuries before the Spaniards reintroduced the animal to North America. Though airline pilots and later observant investigators and writers instantaneously recognize this figure as a horse, uh, BLM officials claim it depicts a puma and have restricted the public from accessing the area. Does that look like a puma to you? Come on, man. That's the horse right there. And they don't even let people go there. You see, it's restricted. Continuing, it says here, in addition to petroglyphs, pictographs, geoglyphs, and figurines, carvings of horses on pre-Columbian structures also exist. Milton R. Hunter addresses the presence of a carving that he describes as a clear representation of a horse with a person. This carving presented in the photograph below figure 9 is etched into the Mayan Temple of the Plaques at Chichen Itza and the Yucatan. All right, zoom in a little bit. You see the horse right here? That's definitely a horse, a person on a horse. That's definitely a horse. And a Mayan uh, plaque right here in Chichen Itza. This is uh, pre-Columbian, all right? In his book titled Archaeology and the Book of Mormon, Hunter quotes his Maya guide as having explained the following about this carving. Some of the most outstanding Maya scholars and archaeologists, such as Dr. J. Eric S. Thompson and Dr. Sylvanus G. Morley, date the erection of most of these buildings of Asichin Issa probably about 1000 AD. If their dating is correct, in, in all probability, this representation of the horse was carved about 500 years before Columbus discovered America. It stands to reason that if these ancient Maya people had had no horses to observe, they could not have carved a likeness of one on this building. You see, the horse. They continue in the article, the relationship between the indigenous people of the Americas and the horse, deconstructing a European myth, we're in part 6.3, and it says here fossil remains. So, so many accounts of bones, fossils being found all over uh, the Americas. It says here, only a decade earlier, naturalist Charles Darwin also found fossil remains of the horse together with mammoths in what is now Buenos Aires, Argentina, South America. John Van Wy, his work titled The Complete Work of Charles Darwin, online explains the following regarding his experience. He could not excavate the case from the bed, which was unquestionably above the limestone, but in compensation, he found tooth of a horse. This was a puzzling find. It was believed at the time that there had been no horses in the Americas before Europeans brought them over in the 16th century. Darwin wondered if the tooth had been washed down. This little tooth had great significance for Darwin. The state of preservation compelled him to believe that the horse was contemporaneous with the extinct mastodon. Owen in fossil mammalia was able to only to confirm that Darwin had indeed found remains of mastodon, but also that the horse tooth and the one he found in Darwin's collection from Punta Alta was a pre-Columbian Ecus Curvidens, all right, a horse, pre-Columbian, proving that horses had existed but gone extinct the Americas before reintroduction from the old world, all right? So horses were here, they have finding bones again. We continue in the book, the relationship between the indigenous people of the Americas and the horse, deconstructing a Eurocentric myth. It says here in the article titled The American Horse by E.L. Berthold in 1881, within the Scientific American Supplement, Volume uh, 12, here he speaks of a map created by the Venetian explorer Sebastian Cabot, 
Piloto Meyer of Charles V, King of Spain, he explains as follows. This map drawn in circular projection by Cabot himself, on which he has delineated his own and the discoveries of John Cabot is of singular value as representing the true state of geography and discovery in the early portion of the 16th century and was drawn prior to the year 1546-47. Now it is an incontestable fact that Cabot went in 1527 to the east coast of South America on an exploring voyage that he discovered the rivers La Palata and Panina and explored them some distance inland, returning to Spain in 1530. In addition, he was, has marked on the map pictures of the natives, prominent animals, and some trees, and that at the head of La Plata with the puma and the parrot, or perhaps the condor, he has given the horse as apparently a quadruped that existed then in those vast plains of the Gran Chaco, where today they roam in countless herds. It may be claimed that this is not proof of their native origin, but we claim that it is fair presumption for neither Spaniards in Peru or other parts of America nor even Portuguese had been long enough in South America for the few Spanish horses introduced to have roamed wild from Peru to the head of Paraguay and Parana rivers and increased in numbers sufficiently to have attracted the attention of the Spanish explorers. The period was too short and the distance too great from the Spanish possessions in Peru across the vast forest of the Andes for such a rapid increase. We can reconcile this discrepancy only by believing that the paternity of the vast herds of the Argentine Republic and Paraguay was a native breed of American horses mixing afterward with the Spanish breed introduced by the conquerors. All right, this is the map. Of course, they show a couple of colored natives there. They got horses here drawn. All right, horses in this map. There were numerous there. Continuing in this article, we got more excavations here. This is in the Hill Caves of Yucatan, uh, a search for evidence of man's antiquity in the caverns of Central America. They're talking about what they were finding there. And it says here, Mercer and his team's excavation of these caves yielded horse remains, such as horses' teeth and the first phalanx and deep layers within two caves. This, along with their type of rare pottery and frequent polished postures of fine make that were found within those same level layers would indicate a pre-Columbian time period when the indigenous peoples of the area and the horse were together. The indigenous people there and the horse were together, all right? Europeans did not bring horses over here. We got a lot of evidence, a lot of archaeology, a lot of proof, all right, to debunk your theories. All right, so there's a lot of excavations, a lot of examples she's showing here. You guys can get the... Uh, uh, let you know where you can find this uh, whole article at the end of this video. But they did a lot of excavations, a lot of pre-Columbian evidence of the horse and American indigenous people being together. All right. Like this example right here, just want to say, uh, says, however, there have been modern discoveries that have compelled archaeologists to pause and take a second look because the time frame determined scientifically and the surrounding clues clearly do not match the dominant culture's version of history. An example of this occurred in Carlsbad in 2005, when archaeologists unearthed and radiocarbon dated a nearly intact skeleton of a horse that may have lived and died 50 years before the Spanish began their conquest of California and had been buried ritualistically. The article titled Centuries Old Bones of Horses Unearthed in Carlsbad by Philip K. Arlen states as follows. The finds are significant because native North American horses were thought to have been extinct more than 10,000 years ago, and the remains are older than the recorded conquest of the Spanish. Radiocarbon dating of 340 years plus or minus 40 years puts the death of the horse sometime between 1625 and 1705, all right? Therefore, the horses died at least 50 years before the San Diego Mission de Alcala the first of the California missions was founded in 1769. It was older than that. The bones of the horses and the donkey showed no signs of having been shot and indicated that the horses were not brought by the Spanish who fitted their horses with iron shoes. All right. This is the image right here of the excavation. Again, they found an intact horse in the pre-Columbian time, not pre-Columbian, but pre-European settlement time in California. And it was buried ritualistic. The Indians, the American people, buried it ritualistically. 
unearths horse skeleton in Carlsbad, California, says here, figure 11, all right? Other instances where carbon dating was utilized to test the age of horse bones occurred in a study led by Dr. Stephen Jones, Professor Wade Miller, Joaquin Arroyo Cabrales, Patricia M. Fazio, and Shelby Saberon. In this study, accelerator mass spectrometer dating methods were utilized. The goal was to provide radiocarbon dates for samples that appeared from death and other considerations to be pre-Columbian. The following independent laboratories were utilized to conduct the AMS dating process. Stafford Laboratories in Colorado, the University of California at Riverside, and Beta Analytic in Miami, Florida. According to Jones, the following samples of echoes that were found in North America were verified as being within the time frame that extends from 10,000 before the present, after the last ages, to 500 before the present when Spaniards began bringing horses to America. So it was in between that time. It was pre-Columbian. It says here, the first of these was found in Pratt Cave near El Paso, Texas, by Professor Ernest Lundelius of Texas A&M University. He provided a horse bone from Pratt Cave, which dated to 6,000 BC. This date is well since the last ice age, into the time frame when all American horses should have been absent. All right, remember, they told us they died 12,000 years ago, so it shouldn't exist in 6,000 BC in America. So they should be absent, they're saying here. According to the prevailing paradigm, Another echo specimen was identified by Elaine Anderson, an expert in echoes identification at Wolf Spider Cave, Colorado. It dated AD 1260 to 1400, a horse. All right. The carbon dating has proven this, people. Are right? you guys seeing this? Debunked. Totally debunked. They were here already. The horse was here. All right. Debunked. The Europeans did not bring the horse. Again, clearly before the Columbus. All right. Dr. Fashu alerted us to a horse bone found at Horse Thief Cave in Wyoming, which dates to approximately 3,124 before the present. Example, 1100 BC, using thermoluminescent methods. We attempted to have this bone redated using the AMS methods, which are more accurate, but there proved to be insufficient collision in the bone to permit AMS dating. The 1100 BC date, although approximately still stands, all right, it still stands. They haven't debunked this. So why are they still teaching us in textbooks that the universe that the Europeans brought horses if they if this still stands? Another modern echoes discovery in which the horse remains that were scientifically dated fell within the supposed extinction period occurred with the uncovering of a horse skeleton in southwestern Wyoming, which appeared to be partially buried by natives people. As was mentioned in previous chapter, scientific evidence of echoes or the horse was also found during the proposed extinction period in a study called Found Map, a database documenting late quaternary distributions of mammal species in the United States. This study, headed by Graham and Lundelius Jr., was published by the Illinois State Museum in 1994. Its purpose was to create a synthetic database to document the late quaternary distribution of mammals, species in 48 contiguous states of the United States for at least 40,000 years. Scientific evidence of echoes remains were found in a variety of soil and fossil samples taken at various archaeological sites throughout North America outside of the time periods accepted by Western science, all right, pre-Columbian. These sites were located in the following states, Arizona, Colorado, Georgia, Kentucky, Montana, North Dakota, New Mexico, New York, Ohio, South Dakota, Washington, and Wyoming. Interestingly, researchers later categorized many of these findings of echoes as out, which they defined to mean unit of finding unquestionable. So because they proved to be pre-Columbian, they couldn't accept that, they couldn't go public with it, they just put out in, qu in quotes, right? Out. Meaning they didn't know. It's, it's questionable. It's questionable because it doesn't fit their lies, their stories, their high. The article, the relationship between the indigenous people of the Americas and the horse, deconstructing a Europe-centric myth, and you know we have debunked it, all right? And this is part 8.1, conclusion. Yes, it has been said that the conquerors write the history. However, in order for a conqueror to exist and history to be finalized, the battle must be over. Are right, you hear that? Indigenous peoples across the Americas and indeed throughout the world are rising to support the validity of the cosmology, anxiology, ontology, and epistemology of their ancestors, as well as to advocate for the capacity of traditional knowledge systems to create sustainable cultures for the next seven generations. This movement has proved that the outcome of the battle has yet to be decided. 
It has been shown in this research project that latest technologies being utilized by Western science may hold the key to unlocking the truth about the history of the horse in the Americas in a way that the dominant Western culture can understand. The original teachings of many of the indigenous peoples of the Americas do not show that the horse was introduced to the natives people by the Spanish or by other European explorers. In fact, the knowledge collected in this investigation describes the horse not as a beast of burden or a living tool introduced to the indigenous people by foreigners, but as a holy relative gifted to them for caretaking by the creator long ago in such a way of being horse, man, woman, and child stood by one another in times of celebration and in times of great need. Indeed, they were truly relatives. Although the genocide of the native people and their ponies was a standing policy of the United States government until the mid-1800s, public outcry eventually caused a shift. As a result, policies of genocide would give way to assimilation, while the remaining indigenous peoples of the Americas were systematically stripped of their language, societal structures, sacred places, and ceremonies, and torn apart from their own peoples and families. The dominant Western culture also simultaneously tore the native ponies away from everything that helped to make them who and what they were. These four-legged relatives were turned into beasts of burden, purposefully mixed with other types of horses to be improved, shipped by the hundreds of thousands to fight wars and lose their lives in faraway countries, and doomed to be labeled as something other than what they are. Yet despite all of this, both the native people of the Americas and their indigenous ponies still stand, and if brought together once again, and who and what they truly are, this sacred hoop can be mended. With regard to this topic, the foundation upon which Western academia currently lies was created out of fear, prejudice, greed, desperation, and misunderstanding. Naturally, this cannot stand as long as people are sincerely seeking knowledge and understanding if Western academia and the knowledge of indigenous people can be utilized on an equal academic footing to offer a more complete and accurate history of what was for the native people flora and fauna of the Americas at the time of first contact, then the end of the battle in this portion of the world can be glorious for both sides. Indeed, had more of the initial and early conquistadors admitted to the Spanish crown and other authorities that the native people of the Americas already had highly developed horse cultures at the time of first contact, it is likely that the legal criteria for colonization that the Spanish had could not have been met as the horse was so closely entwined with the concept of civilization for the Spanish peoples. The sophistication and advancement nature of indigenous cultures throughout the Americas would not have been as easy to overlook. We have arrived at an era in which the latest technology combined with guidance from the knowledge of our indigenous peoples has the power to open new avenues of possibility for our collective communities. It is time that the Western academia allow the evidence to guide its scholars and not continue to expect them to defer to authority regarding history's preconceived notions of what is acceptable, possible, or comfortable. The time has come for a paradigm shift. All right, my people, the time has come for a paradigm shift. And once again, this has been the relationship between the indigenous peoples of the Americas and the horse deconstructing a Eurocentric myth. And I want to thank very much uh, Yvette Running Horse Colin for this great research and this great article to help us prove, to help us destroy a Eurocentric myth and to know our true past and a true history, a more correct history. So thank you once again, fair use. Hope you guys enjoyed uh, this video. Is there any doubt now? Do you guys have any doubt that the horse was here before Europeans arrived? Well, you shouldn't anymore. 